that uh, thanks for joining us, everyone. Just a heads up that people will be monitoring on social media. So do feed through your questions and the team of Google Project will pick them up and feed them through to me. And I will uh, be able to ask them of uh, our guest this evening um, about 40 minutes or so in. Uh, I remember the first time I heard um, you, Dawn Butler, it was about 2015, I think, and you were on BBC News, uh, and you just totally slayed it, uh, unabashed, straight-talking, authentic, compelling. Uh, since hearing Dawn on the news, uh, I crossed paths with her a number of times, and that's how you, she, just is. Uh, I've read now her new book, uh, A Purposeful Life, uh, and she is on the page as she is refreshing in all three dimensions. Dawn was the third black woman ever to be elected as an MP back in 2005, and the first Afro-Caribbean woman to become a government minister in the UK under Gordon Brown's government. She's an amazing campaigner for social justice and against corruption, uh, Google Projects relied on her for help in Parliament, uh, particularly focused on um, the Met Police. And of course, um, she famously got kicked out of the House of Commons for the uh, crime of telling the truth. Um, she called Boris Johnson earlier than everybody else did uh, a liar. Uh, she's also a personal hero of mine. So it's a great pleasure for me to be interviewing her about her new book. Uh, Dawn Butler. Oh, thank you for that warm intro, Joe. I appreciate um, that. Oh, well, it's no less than you deserve. Um, uh, your book is called A Purposeful Life. Um, did you always know your life had a purpose or has that sort of come to you rather later? Oh, no, I think it's just come to me quite late. Like, I do things and I think, oh, everybody else would do that. It's only kind of when you get older that you realise actually, you know, people were not selling flowers, especially if you was cutting them from somebody else's garden. But, you know, people weren't doing the things that you were doing or fighting for the things that you were fighting for necessarily. And it was just kind of, it's actually really when writing the book and putting it all together that you think, this is why I am the way I am. This is why I do the things I do. And you know, this is my purpose. Um, reading it, the thing that really struck me was how much of your life is about, uh, as Ghislaine Kinwani um, memorably put it, the title of her book, uh, how much of your life is about living whilst black. Um, and except for when I get out in the bright sunshine on holiday, I literally never think about the colour of my skin. I literally never think about it. Um, and it's a fairly hardcore opener. But how is um, life in England? Um, bearing in mind, I'm guessing that most of uh, the audience this evening is going to be like me. How is life in England if you are black? different from my life as, as somebody who is white? Well, we are constantly being reminded of the colour of our skin. And if you're in the public domain like I am, you know, you have people will throw things at me all the time. You know, why don't you comment on this? Why don't you comment on that? and yet still not hear or listen to the things that I am commenting on. And, you know, some people say, well, like I remember when I first went into parliament and this was from a friendly person. So it wasn't from somebody, it was somebody who's been helpful, felt they were being helpful. And they said to me, um, gave me some words of wisdom and said advice. And it was, don't be too black. And that was the advice that I was given. And, and as I said, this is one person who's being nice. So they weren't being horrible. They thought they were being helpful. And I had to remind them that, you know, I don't want to hide my blackness. I'm not ashamed of my blackness. I go to bed black. I wake up in the morning black. I'm fighting for issues that I care about that affect me, my constituents, my family. 
and the and the thing the truth is around race and the issues that I fight about, and I'm sure that you're going to come onto this, but the truth is, if you take the police, for instance, if people had listened to what black people are saying, like my parents were saying all those years ago, we would have had a better police service now. And that is a fact. If people had listened to my brothers when they talked about how they got unfairly stopped every single week, how they couldn't drive their car without being stopped, how the police officers try to strip search him on the street. If people had listened to my brother's voices in the 70s, we would have had we would have a better police service now. Yeah, and and, and that's uh um the 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 police um and the treatment of um black people and the treatment uh that you have endured and your brothers have endured. Um, by the the Met is a big part of uh, of the book. Um, I remember um, uh, sort of uh, progressive, liberal progressive, white society in England being appalled by George Floyd's murder. Mm. Um, but if you looked on social media, there are also a lot of people saying. Well, God, it's terrible in America, but at least the police here are not like the police over there. And I want to say explicitly, because I think it's important um, that back in 2020, I was I was one of them. I was one of those people who did not um, who, 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 who were drawing that contrast. And the reason I'm making that point explicit is because I want to tell everybody that it's fine to be on a journey, right? Um, yeah. However um, enlightened or woke or sentient, choose your synonym you become, um, you're still always going to be on a journey. And that's okay. What's not okay is um, standing still or, or, or not not being interested. But but that aside, um, was the 2020 me um, right to say and think that um, the quality of policing in the UK is um, just um, so much better than the quality of policing in, in the US? Yeah, the, the thing is, is, is the experience, right? Like we always say, thank God, our police do not carry guns routinely. Because if our police carried guns routinely, we would have exactly the same problem as the police have and as the people have in America. So the only real difference is the gun situation. That's the only real difference. We have problems with police officers. Well, we know within the Met, one in 34 officers are suspended. We know the figures are higher than that. We know that the Met is institutionally racist, institutionally sexist, institutionally misogynistic, institutionally homophobic. So we know that there's problems. So the difference with George Floyd, and it wasn't the first time that uh, a black man had been murdered by the police, the difference was it had been recorded, but not just it had been recorded, it had been recorded from all the different angles and you had all the different elements. You had the element of somebody calling the police while the police were murdering an innocent black man. You had, some, you had the recording of that conversation. So that was the big difference. And I think the other, the other major difference, and this would have been a turning point for many people, is that we were at home, we were in lockdown. So whereas before people would have been busy with their day, they would have gone to work, they might have missed it. You literally couldn't miss this news, this bit of information, this video recording of a black man being killed by an officer with his knee on his neck for nine minutes. You couldn't miss that information because you were stuck at home. And that was the difference. So I think that was the turning point for a lot of people. And that's why a lot of organizations were then like, okay, you know, um, what can we do? You know, how can we? And the problem with that was black people were traumatized. I was traumatized by 
George's, George Floyd's murder, because it reminded me of a situation with my brother. And I mentioned that in the book where I called my brother and I said, bro, do you remember when, you know, the police arrested you and put you in the back of the van? And my brother said, sis, do I remember? I've still got the scars. And then he proceeded to talk me through what happened. And it was like it was yesterday for him. But it was the first time I was hearing how the police had put their knees on his back, on his neck, you know, how they abused him in the back of the police van. And as he was telling me the story, there was just like this tear falling down my eyes because I thought I could have lost my brother because I called the police. And they, they always told me, don't call the police. And I don't want to um, hijack a conversation um, that is yours, that is about um, colour um, at the moment and turn it into a conversation about policing. But um, it's also true to say that um, protesters, climate change protesters, tell very, very similar stories of how the type of policing um, when the police are being scrutinized, um, when they're being recorded is profoundly different to the type of policing um, when they're not being, when they're not being scrutinized. Um, I was really struck by one passage in your book. Um, I don't know if you've got a copy to hand. Mm -hmm. um, Always got a copy of the book to hand. <laughs> um, uh, everyone else or should also have a copy to hand. <laughs> um, and it's at the bottom of page 65. And there's a couple of paragraphs uh, beginning, I remember once being. And I just wondered whether you could sort of share those paragraphs with with uh with listeners John. sure okay i remember once being the only black person around the table at a meeting we were talking about giving the police extra powers and my colleagues were getting really excited about the policies they wanted to put into place they believed that allowing the police to do whatever they wanted without question or accountability would help stop crime. I kept quiet for as long as I could, trying gently to interject. And then, although it felt scary, I said something like, what you all think is a brilliant idea and are getting very excited about is actually scaring me. Those people did not know black men the way I did. And for me, the conversation immediately brought into mind my four brothers and how their lives would be negatively impacted by these new measures. But the Home Secretary at the time and other ministers were all looking through a different lens. My presence in that room provided a very different insight. Although it was hard for me to speak up that day, I was listened to and the police didn't get the powers they wanted. Thank you, Dawn. Um, um, and this um, need for um, uh, people, particularly people who carry with them privilege, who move through society easily, um, to listen to the different experiences, the lived, different lived experiences of those whose um, pathway through life is not a privileged one, is a running metaphor in your book. Uh, it's the, the flying cockroach. Um, could you tell us just a little bit about that? Yeah, so it was almost like the first time I can remember being called a liar and also feeling that I had no control of that situation. So 
I was around eight years old, seven, eight years old, and I'd come back from Jamaica with my parents. And in those days, the teacher would say, call each kid up to the front of the class and say, what did you do in your summer holidays? And you would say, whatever. And so I wanted to tell the story of how I saw a cockroach that flew. I mean, it was bloody scary, do you know what I mean? And I wanted to kind of tell that story and I was expecting that the class would be like, woo, you know, cockroaches and, and all of this stuff. And, you know, be like the cool kid telling a scary story. And the teacher just told me to stop lying. And I was really confused because I thought, I'm not lying. This is, this happened to me. This is my lived experience and it was scary. And I had a choice. She said, I ever had to sit down and essentially sort of apologize for lying or go outside the room. And when we were sent outside the classroom, it meant that the head teacher would be roaming through the corridors. And if they see a naughty kid outside the classroom, you get then taken to the head teacher's office where you get into trouble. And so I opted to go outside the room, but I didn't wait for the head teacher. I, you know, climbed over the fence and the wall and <laughs> went and got my dad instead. But it was kind of when I look back, sort of when I journey back for all of that, it's kind of, it's, it's a lesson, you know, it's a, it's a lesson in knowing and understanding your truth and your lived experience and not allowing others to move that. Like that teacher, because she hadn't experienced it, she thought I was lying. And because there wasn't Google then, she couldn't even Google it on her phone to just have a little check. For her, it was, I don't recognize what this little black girl is saying. So she's lying and she has to get out. And um, uh, we all of us um, have to move through life. Um, those of the audience, at least, that look and sound um, more like me than you carry a responsibility not to be that teacher not to assume that our understanding of the world um, accurately, though it might reflect our experiences, um, might not reflect um, the experiences of, of others. Absolutely. For some people, the system works as it should, but it doesn't mean that that system works as it should for everybody. You know, for some people, the first thing they would do when they're in trouble is think of is to call the police. But that, that's because they feel that the police will protect them. For some people who've been underprotected by the police and overpoliced, that wouldn't be the first call that they make because they don't see safety in that call. And we can all use our privilege. And I say that we all have privilege. You know, I have the privilege of hearing and I learned how to sign for deaf people. We can all use our privilege for good, you know, if we choose to. And that's the thing, it has to be a choice. It's like, if we are going to dismantle the injustices in society, it really has to be a choice because it's not gonna happen if you sit on your backside and do nothing. If you just, you know, if you're just gonna live your life and say, well, I'm fine, you know, I'm cool, then nothing's ever going to change. So it is a choice, it's an active choice. Thank you. Yeah. And, and um, I mean, I was trying to think about how to communicate this point so that it really resonated. Um, and uh, of course, um, something like half of those watching this evening will be will be women. And what we've learned about how the Metropolitan Police um, responds to to women will have um, reshaped uh, the expectation uh, of many of us, um, whatever the color of our skin, um, as to how much the police can be trusted. And maybe that's a way to, to, to understand uh, how the police um, present to you um, if, you're, if, if, you're, if you're black, if you don't already know. Um, 
I mean, what, what needs to be done to reform um, uh, the police storm? Well, I mean, I've been going on a journey with this question, you know, um, because I'm kind of getting to the point where I'm thinking the, the Met Police, uh, which is the service that I know most about, is too big. And I'm getting to the point where I think it needs to be broken up into different sections. I think that the person who's going to do the real reforms of the police isn't a former police officer. I don't think a former police officer can because they they are indoctrinated into the police service. So they, they, they feel torn, you know, they feel torn that they're letting down, you know, other police officers. And it needs to be somebody who is just effective and kind of impartial and just wants the best service possible. And, and however they get to that point, they get to that point. You know, so if it means that you have to dismiss 50% of the current police officers, then so be it, you know, because that is what's needed. At the end of the day, there's there's too many things happening and, I, and I'm pleased it's been exposed, um, but it's been exposed at a slower rate, but things are happening. But there's a lot to be done. There's a lot to be done. And these police officers who are misogynistic are not just misogynistic, you know, Wayne Cousins wasn't just, he didn't start with murder, murder, you know. He did other things that was excused in the police service. And there's lots of police officers that knew what he was like. And there's a lot more police officers like that, I suspect. I'm not saying they're all murderers before everyone kicks off or rapists, but there are a lot of police officers who are violent, and misogynistic and racist, and that is a fact. I'm trying to remember, but is it something like 10% of the Metropolitan Police um, are suspended or face disciplinary proceedings? Yeah, for... there's, yeah there's currently one in 34, so there's, there's like a thousand police officers at the moment. But that's going to get bigger. You know, when you think about, if you take um, the WhatsApp group, for instance, where the tragic murders uh, in Brent of Bibra and Nicole and the officers took pictures of their murdered bodies and posted it on a WhatsApp group. There were 34 officers on that WhatsApp group. And I think only three or so complained so the rest of those police officers, if they didn't think that that was something they should have complained about or reported, then they the, they should probably be dismissed from the service because that is unacceptable behaviour. So this is why I'm saying that there's a lot more than we all currently know about. Yeah, thank you. Um, and of course, that's current uh, disciplinary proceedings, not... Um, current or, or historic. No. Um, uh, and, and, and again, um, and, and the final um, time I'll sort of take a, a, a run at, at this issue. Um, for those who want to challenge themselves, who want to understand how their lives um, are unrepresented, unrepresentative of those with a different skin colour. Is there anything else? Um, I mean, your book is really, really wonderful on this. Um, really wonderful. Uh, what's the second book, um, Dawn, that people should buy or the, the second thing they should do? What should they watch? Um, I think if you want to understand biases and how how biases work and present in everyday life because we all have biases so if you want to kind of understand biases I would read uh Jennifer Edberhardt's book Biased it was a very powerful book decades of research on different police services and it also um 
made me understand certain things. So when police officers say things like, I smell cannabis, when they see a black person, it's psychosomatic. So they believe themselves, they are so uh, conditioned to this narrative that they actually believe themselves that they smell cannabis when they see a black person. And this is why I say that every police officer needs to be re-vetted and have psychological testing. Because some, um, it, you know, for some it's too late because they associate crime with blackness and that's it. And that's why we have the problems that we have. And it's a perpetual circle. So that would that would be um, a good book. And I think Kehende Andrews, um, he's got some really good books out uh, that really sort of journeys back through the history. And I think that's another good book to kind of uh, read and just get to groups with, because it, it will take you on a journey of understanding and I think that's what we all need. You know, we all need to go on this journey of understanding because when we understand it in the whole, we can then say, right, okay, I recognize that or can be more sympathetic to somebody else. When they say, I got stopped by the police for doing nothing. You know, people accuse me of that we were speeding. How could we be speeding? We were approaching traffic lights. We we're going five miles an hour. People would accuse me of saying that the driver was black when the driver was white. No, the driver was black. Why would I say the driver's white, the driver's black? You know, all of this because people feel comfortable in their disbelief system and they're trying to they're trying to live in that disbelief system instead of stepping outside it. And I wonder why. And I think if people understand that racism exists, then they might feel that they have to do something about it. And the reason why I think it's important is because you know, we've got a we've got a very uh, corrupt uh, government. This anti woke narrative is just a ruse. Um, you know, they're perpetuating racism. Their report that they commissioned, where the UN condemned it and said that they are trying to normalize white supremacy. This is what you know. You've got two women of color who are bidding to be the next leader of the party because they think Rishi Sunak's a goner. So, and they're like going to be as right wing as they possibly can. We all have to be very mindful because it affects us all in the end. You know, in the beginning, you might think they're just after the black people and that's okay. But in the end, it affects everybody. It affects women, it affects gay people and it will eventually affect white men. They might be last on the list, but it will eventually affect the good ones. So it will it will affect it will affect everybody in the end. Um, thank you, Dawn. That was really powerful. Um, one of the th another theme running through your book is the kind of importance of of community, uh, and you talk about um, the bakery that your your dad ran. Uh, and the place that um, that occupied in the community you grew up in uh, and how um, it was a kind of proper event um, when the bakery stopped uh, and how the community remembered when your dad um, passed. Uh, and um, this belief in the importance of community is one of the kind of few strands I think that unites us that unites sort of um uh what um political commentators call sort of nativists and internationalists that unifies the left and the right uh I'm remembering David Cameron's big society initiative um which spoke to the same desire. It was quite top down. Um, and I guess I'm wondering, um, what, what, what can government do um, to foster that? And what can we do to foster it? This government doesn't want to foster that. This government fears community. This government fears 
unity. This government is all about dividing and hate. That is how they want to stay in power. And as I said, like it, it, it's, it's, it's often easy to fall into that trap of just blaming somebody else or hating somebody else, you know, because that's how our brains are wired, you know. So it takes effort to do the opposite. So forget this government. They're not interested at all in anything to do with community. So we have to stand up and fight ourselves and find and build communities ourselves. That's what we have to, because the majority of people in this country are good people. The, the problem is, is that we have some bad people in power or some bad people with power. Let's put it that way. We have some bad people with power and bad people with power do bad things. Right? They do bad things with that power, whether it be stealing from the public purse. We've done a lot of work around that, the Good Law Project, you know, and exposing what the government's done. Whether it's trying to divide communities, whether it's trying to throw certain communities under the bus, whether it's migrants, whether it's the LGBTQI plus community, it's an, all a deliberate plan. And for me, it's, it's upsetting and it makes me angry because for them, it's it's like it's a game. You know, they will they will walk away from their time in government having made their friends richer and made the rest of the country poorer and isolated some members of the community who have worked so hard to just be themselves, to be their authentic selves. And they will walk away and they will not care. And it, it really does um, upset me. And that's why we have to work even harder to be a community you know, to look out for each other, to support each other, to to understand that everybody's lived experience is different, but it is valid and relevant. So um, you would say um, government doesn't need to do anything to foster our desire to form communities around us. It needs to stop doing things. Uh, it needs to stop um, deliberately dividing us. Yeah, this government is determined to divide us. The powers, the, the rest of the chapter went on to talk about the powers that this government implemented over COVID and what happened then, you know, and how black people were stopped at a higher rate, how they were fined at a higher rate. You know, this government is deliberately doing things to to divide communities, to, to pick a community against each other, you know, and they are, you know, they are fake. They are fake in everything that they do. You know, they don't, they don't even really care about the police. If they cared about the police, they would, they wouldn't have stripped the police of 23,000 officers and 20 odd thousand uh, back staff in the offices. You know, they would have paid the police a decent wage, but, you know, because, so they don't really care. And so, no, I don't think we can rely on this government. But I do feel that governments play a role because the first the, the first aim of any government should be to protect its citizens. That is our that is the duty of government. That's the first duty of government to protect to protect our citizens. And that should be the fundamental point of government which I don't think this government has done in its 13 odd years in power. But the government does have a role to play in doing that. A good government does it really well. A good government fosters good relations within communities. And um, looking to the other side of um, uh, this parliament, um, let's make the assumption supported by the polls at the moment that there's a Labour Party in power. Um, what would you be asking um, the front bench, um, assuming of course you're not back on it, uh, to do to um, foster, <coughs> excuse me, this thing that um, uh, unifies, uh, still unifies much of us, this desire for community? Are there initiatives that, that, that a, a better government than this one might embark upon? And if so, what do they look like? 
So I'm doing my own little manifesto, Joe. <laughs> so I've got a manifesto that I'm putting together and also um, one where I've spoken to lots of party members. I've gone around London and I've like spoken to them and got their ideas. And so I'm putting together pieces of a manifesto, basically it's sort of a London manifesto, but it will be applicable to other parts of the country too. And I would want the Labour Party to commit to what's in the manifesto because it is things that are needed and it's not it's not necessarily a wish list, it's it's an urgent to-do list of things that needs to be done. Thank you. Um, and you've also spoken about um, how you want a platform to tell other people's stories recognising um, that people see you as being someone they can talk to, they can trust, they can confide in. What, what do you think that might look like? Well, ideally, I'd love to either do some documentaries or, um, or have my own TV show. I would, I would love to do that and just have people on. And as I say, like them, as you say, them telling their stories and us, us kind of delving into that and just given a platform to different. I meet so many fascinating people who have such a rich story to tell, who can help to change, you know, the world with those stories. And I'd love to be able to, to yeah, to have a platform to do that. Yeah. Um, and final question from me, um, uh, is being an MP, um, you've got the, the abuse, the antisocial hours, the sort of public distrust in politics and politicians. Um, do you do you still think that being an MP is is worth it, Don? Most days, but not every day. <laughs> but um, but most days, I still feel I have a lot to do, but I don't feel that I will retire as a as a member of Parliament. What does um? What are the bits of your job that give you particular pleasure? Oh, my constituents. Honestly, like helping my constituents in Brent, uh, that gives me a lot of pleasure. Um, getting stuff done, sorting things out for them, that gives me joy. Uh, I would say second to that is like, you know, having a go at the Tories, that gives me a bit of pleasure too. Um, you know, getting them to do U-turns, getting them to backtrack, catching them out, you know, all of that stuff is is great. You know, doing committee work and, you know, just calling them out and saying that's a lie and being able to say that's a lie and, well, even though you're not allowed to say it, but, being, but knowing for full well that it's a lie and calling it out, that gives me pleasure because it means that I'm doing something, you know, I'm in a, I'm in a, I'm in a corrupt system, if you like, but at least I'm doing something and, and every little bit matters. And I truly believe that. So that's why I like working with you guys, because, you know, you do a lot of the work and the investigating. So I know that if I'm in committee and I say, well, I've got this from the Good Law Project, and I know that comes with stuff that backs it up. And so I, I love that. We've caught them out so many times. Um, my kids uh, see me go into the garden on a on a weekend and dig holes and do manual labour, and they say, "Dad, you kind of work really hard. Um, why are you doing this on your weekend?" And I'm like, "Because um, my life is a succession of um, never-ending jobs, jobs that just never get finished." And I kind of like, you know, you, you dig a hole, uh, you stick a tree in, and then and then it's done. Um, so I totally get it with the, the getting stuff done. Now, you let slip a, an interesting thing a second ago, which I wouldn't want you to think I've missed. 
Um, you said you didn't think you would retire as an MP. Um, would you like to be a little bit more explicit than that about um, what the future might hold? Well, um, you know, if if somebody picks me up and says they're going to, we're going to put this, you can have your own show, Dawn. You've got food to do whatever you want. You know, that that could persuade me to like move over to do that. But, um, but and I'd like to kind of um, be mayor of London. That would be something that I would love to do. Yeah. As, as my last political kind of position. And um, have you got, because you and Sadiq Khan are mates, aren't you, as I uh, know, having read the book, have you got a, a little plan with him? No, it's, it's, not, it's not a Gordon and 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 uh, and Tony kind of you, you know in, in a curry house, <laughs> but uh, but no, but no, I've I've told him that I'd I'd like to have his job. I think it's and I think if you're if you're friends, you know, you should you should tell them. Um, so and I've told him to hurry up so that I can like <laughs> go for it. But uh, but when he's ready to go, and I will put my hat in the ring. That's um. Very kind. Thank you um, so much for that, Dawn. We've got some questions from um, viewers uh, and we've still got space for a couple more as well. So if you're watching uh, and you'd like to share um, those questions uh, with us, then then please do. Good Law Project colleagues are watching the social media feeds and you can just um, type your questions in. First question is from Rachel. Um, so you get um uh torrents of misogyny uh and racism um how do you deal with that how do you stay calm uh it depends on the day so no two days are the same and um you know i've deleted more tweets than i've sent <laughs> and, and uh so, and that's quite as, that's like something that I've had to learn as well. Um, but it depends. So most days I, I don't scroll or I block or I mute because especially when, you know, it's the people that have like 10 followers, and they're the most abusive. And you're like, no wonder you've got no friends. Because you're just an abusive little twat. Do you know what I mean? You're not even a bot. You're just somebody that hasn't got a lot of friends. So, um, so, so, yeah. I just don't respond or tweet. And and it's good to have people around you who you can talk to and confide in, and you can say, "I'm having a bad day," you know, and they will help you through it. And you know, Sadiq's actually one of those friends. So it's good to have that. So you just got to surround yourself with good people. And that's how I get through it most of the time. Um, if somebody like is really abusive, like we had to report one today. I can't remember they were talking about another one talking about shooting or something. You know, I will I will report it to the police um, and have the police deal with it. And we've had people that have been imprisoned and, and have had official warnings, etc. So and the weird, you know, the weirdest thing that I found about some of the abusers is uh, some of them are really old. Like there was this guy, he was 77 years old and he sent me a really abusive email and the police found him and he apologized. He sent me an apology letter, which I didn't want to accept. I said, no, actually, I want a face-to-face -face apology and I want to see him. And the police were like, no. And then they said, he's got, his wife is Indian. And like the police were making excuses for him. I said, just because his wife's Indian, that doesn't excuse his, racist, his racism, his racist behavior. So, but that surprises me when they're, you know, in their 70s and 80s. I think, God, have you got anything better to do with your day? Um, we've been a bit a bit down on the piece. Um, I, I'm, I'm remembering um, when somebody else referred one of the death threats that I got to Durham Constabulary. Um, and uh, 
Durham Constabulary called me up after they had dealt with this death threat. And they said that they had waited until um, this guy's um, wife was home uh, and they'd gone round um, to his house and they'd insisted on seeing them both in this guy's front room uh, and they yeah. had um, given him a um, full-on bollocking and Brilliant. one of the officers had been watching um, the wife uh, out of the corner of, of his eye <laughs> uh, whilst the other officer was, was bollocking my uh, the, 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 the guy who sent me a death threat and, and, and they called me up and they said we're pretty sure that won't happen again, Jolie. <laughs> Brilliant. Love that. I mean, that is the thing, right? It's like, that's why I wanted a face-to-face -face with this guy, because I wanted to confront him, and then I wanted if he had any kids for them to know, and for his grandchildren to know, and for his Indian wife, if she didn't know, to know that he spent time writing me like a full-page abusive letter. Um, but, yeah, unfortunately, the police didn't allow it. I don't know why the police feel sorry for them, but, hey yeah um and what's the thing you're most proud of um having achieved as a as an mp don that's a question from from vic i suppose making history because it's funny like there's so many people learning that for the first time through my book i even had i had this woman send me another really like passive aggressive uh email saying you weren't the first elected black female minister. Why are you saying that? Why are you lying? It's like, why would I lie about that? You know, it's, it's no, actually, it's true. The fact that you don't know about it, you should ask yourself, why don't you know about it? Why isn't it talked about? You know, why isn't it something to be proud of? Um, you know, why doesn't the Labour Party talk about it more? I don't know the answer to that. So I'm very proud of that because that's something that will be uh, in the history books and in parliamentary records, which I had to make sure it was. Um, and I say that unashamedly. Um, and then I'm just proud. I'm proud of the bits that nobody sees because, you know, those bits kind of bring me joy. So I'm proud of those. I'm proud of that too. And I'm proud that I survived. I'm proud that I've survived 100% of my bad days. Sticking around is the, the greatest revenge, isn't it? It is. Um, so, question from Scribbles Squitch. Uh, would you support the use of a citizen a citizens' assembly so um, people can contribute to, to big ideas about how we want to live? I mean, this is kind of part of your theme of, of um, participatory community democracy and, and people's own life experiences matter. I'd love that. I'd love to have more citizens' assemblies. I think we need to have one uh, to talk about proportional representation, for instance. Um, I think that we need to have citizens' assemblies for lots of things. So I, I would totally um, support that. And I would like, I would have like a regular thing um, to say, uh, I would have a regular thing. I feel like I'm disappearing in, in, in the dark, so I'm trying to get a light. Um, I would have a regular thing um, where I would take views from people to say, what is it that you want? How do you, you know, how, and just take open questions, no matter what it is, just take open questions from people. I would run, I would run government that way. I would run, you know, London that way as Mayor of London. I would run my talk show that way. You know, I think um, because because I think, as I say, there are more good people than bad. So, yeah, you're going to get some abusive ones, but we'll get rid of them. But I think what I what I'd love for and and as you mentioned earlier, this is the citizen thing. I want everyone to feel invested, you know, invested in the area that we live in invested in the government that's why i think voting is so powerful and important and everybody should vote but i want everyone to feel invested and people will feel more invested if they feel they've got a voice and so the more you can give people a voice the better yeah um that idea um if if if, if like you are and i am you're essentially optimistic about um uh, human nature um you think that people um almost all of them 
are good and want the same things that we want and you ask yourself why um, people behave in ways that are destructive very often it's because they don't feel like they have any sense of agency any sense of power any voice that matters no control over what happens in their lives and in their communities and um, giving them a voice through citizens assemblies um, or on the talk show that I'm sure the TV show I'm sure you'll 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 shortly have um, <laughs> is absolutely uh, the antidote to, to, to that problem um, Next question, um, how worried are you? This is from Laura, by the way. How worried are you about voter ID, Dawn? Mm. Voter ID is absolutely a ploy, and Jacob Rees-Mogg let it slip, that it was to try and suppress Labour's vote. But what happened was, there was a lot of older people who obviously didn't get the memo um, and didn't bring ID with them and didn't return. And so he said that, you know, basically they uh, they messed up. Um, there really is not a problem. The, the problem was like something like 0.01% or something like that of the electorate was ever involved in any form of voter ID. So it really wasn't a problem. And I think... Maybe if people realise that the reason for voter ID is to suppress the vote because the Tories feel that this is the way that they will win, then people will fight back against it. You know, there's so many things where I think that people should be on the streets just protesting. You know, just like understand the reason why they're trying to take your vote away is because they know that the majority of people will vote against them because they They've not done a good job. They're 13 years in government. And so I'm really concerned about voter ID. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, um, Don. And um, uh, what about PR? You will have been at Labour Party conference, Red Party conference, voted for um, Labour to have proportional representation as part of its manifesto. Um uh, is that going to happen? Um, would you like it to happen? I think we need to have more debate and discussion around it and how it would actually work because um, straight PR wouldn't wouldn't work well because it would sever the link between MPs and their constituents. And so we need one that works, that keeps that link. But I definitely think it's something that we have to debate and discuss and look to how we um, would implement something like that. I mean, the weirdest thing is, is that, and this is another thing that the Tories have done to try and win London, is that they've changed the voting system from PR to first past the post. So, so in a, in a, in the mayoral election, normally you can vote more than once. So, you know, you could vote Green and then vote Labour and that would still count and, you know, if Green gets knocked out, then Labour gets the vote. But but the Tories have now changed that. So now you only have one vote. So we've got to go, we've got to educate people around that because, again, this is another way that the Tories are trying to win almost by almost by uh, smoke and mirrors, all by trickery, you know, hoping that people will not understand that they've only got one vote this time. And, you know, they're, they're messing with our democracy for their own selfish reasons and power. So um, the message is uh, don't vote. I'm sorry if Count Binface is watching. Um, this year, you cannot cast your first vote for Camp Binface and um, your second vote for, for Sadiq Khan, um, no. lest you end up with uh, the Tory mayoral candidate, who is quite conspicuously racist. Um, yeah. Final question, um, probably not the most difficult question um, you've had this evening uh, from Tig. Um, Dawn Butler. How much are you looking forward to the next general election? <laughs> well, um, I'm looking forward to it, but I want to know when it is, right? Because 
it could happen uh it could happen early next year or they threaten to have it you know in the winter because that's a really awful time to have elections or it could happen as late as january 2025 so um i want the election the election can't come soon enough i hope that labor is lucky enough to win and get into government but i mean i just don't know when it's going to be but yeah i like election i mean i actually like elections because i like talking to people so i like being on the doorstep and talking to people and hearing their views i actually like the buzz around it i don't like losing obviously but i do like elections you, have, you haven't lost <laughs> um it's been a total pleasure, Dawn. Thank you so much. Um, I really, really loved um, your book. Uh, I really, really highly recommend it to everyone who's who's watching. I'm really pleased it's been so well reviewed. Um, and it has been a, a total pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Jodian. It's It was great. Nice having a chat with you. <laughs> bye, everyone that's listening. <laughs> and bye for me as well. <laughs>